Good morning. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. And um, it's always a great uh, privilege, privilege in life to visit the glorious capital of uh, Catalonia, one of my favorite cities in the world. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to see some of you uh, for going to the lights of Barcelona. I just want to state at the outset that, as has been said, I'm going to be talking about health technology assessment. I have a lot of material, and some of it is somewhat complex and technical. So I just want to reassure you that these slides are available for anybody who wants them. They are given to the association, to the conference, anybody who wants to give me their email, I will email them personally. So don't worry too much about taking notes of from the slides, but perhaps you would like to honor me with your attention and uh, you can have the slides anytime you want them. Healthcare, as everybody knows, is expensive. The expectations of society are limitless and never-ending, and therefore the costs of healthcare increase all the time. This is one of the major debates in all societies, including the wealthy and the not-so-wealthy countries, and the increase in healthcare spending is one of the highest areas of concern, especially because of the fact that the world, for the past five or six years, has been in an economic morass, of which there is no end in sight as the good uh, people of this glorious country can attest through experience. And so, healthcare expenditure keeps increasing. This is something of substantial concern. And so, we find ourselves looking at what is designated as the Iron Triangle of Healthcare and the balance and the tensions between access, costs, and quality. All these three things are in the mix and the synthesis of what comes out is what effectively we are going to be talking about in many ways today. So what I'm going to do is to discuss a bit the general concepts of what we call health technology assessment to try and explain why these are very important today. I will give some detailed examples in relation to these concepts and although I am relatively ignorant of your community, I will show how some of these have been applied to alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in ways which personally cause me concern. And then I will suggest some ways forward. And in particular, and always emphasizing the absolutely crucial role of patients in this process. Health technology assessment is a kind of catch-all phrase for the process of examining and reporting processes, properties of a medical technology used in healthcare. This is very much a modern concept developed over the past 20 years or so to catch a number of assessment types involving clinical, economic, ethical, legal and organizational aspects. And therefore, when we talk about health technology assessment, we look at a very wide range of issues. And in most healthcare services, where the majority of services, like they are in this country and in most of the European Union, are delivered through the government, health technology assessment has become a huge area of government activity, directly involving and being funded by government. In countries such as the United States, this is not so much the case, but I shall demonstrate that it is becoming increasingly the case there as well. Why are these important? This is important because health technology assessment underpins decisions such as the ones I have shown here, and I shall show examples of these, like should treatment A be reimbursed in a national healthcare system? For which patients should it be provided and for how long? Obviously, you will immediately realize that these are questions which concern all patients with chronic diseases, including your community. And since different decisions can be taken about these technologies, there is a huge variation in access to treatments. 
you can immediately get a flavor of this if you look at the continent of Europe. And some of this was discussed yesterday in relation to alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, type treatments and augmentation therapy. There is already in this continent of Europe a variation between the states of the European Union as to which, is product, which countries provide reimbursed access and which don't, and the levels of access. Now, as I said, in socialized systems, where it is the government, which is the primary payer, the increasing traction is coming from cost-effectiveness analysis, in which the cost is actually part of the decision-making process by the investment agency. It's not just whether the treatment works, but how much it costs. And this is done in what's called cost-effectiveness analysis, and I'm going to have to describe some of the technicalities of this so that I can illustrate it in relation to your community. This is a technique which is now also being applied by private insurers. So it's not just the government. In the United States, for example, many of the private insurers, which are obviously crucial in that country delivering healthcare, use cost-effectiveness analysis increasingly. However, in terms in the United States of what you might call a policy-type environment, the emphasis, fortunately, is more on what we call these days comparative effectiveness research, in which treatments are compared in relation to their effectiveness, but officially costs should not become part of the equation. I shall describe some of this, and I shall also describe, very importantly, the concept which has developed over the past two years of patient-centered outcomes research, or so-called PCOR, which is extremely important. Now, all life is about decisions. And in relation to medical care, there are two areas where there is important decision-making, which needs to be considered, and some of these have already been touched upon, and these include the area of evidence in which we see the issue of utilization of clinical trials. Yesterday there was an eloquent uh, presentation on uh, treatments uh, of the future in Atlantripsin, and we saw the role of clinical trials, and you know about it, systematic reviews which take all these clinical trials and uh, assess uh, the relative benefits, and uh, Dr. Chapman will be talking about this in the later talk. And then there is the question, as I said, of cost-effectiveness, and this, importantly, I think has to include the total medical costs. And this is what I'm going to be emphasizing. This is where my work has centered in chronic diseases. To demonstrate that it's not just the cost of the therapy, we all know that the cost of therapies for chronic rare disorders is high. It is as simple as that. This is not paracetamol, this is not headache medicine, this is not antihypertensive medicine, which most people need at some time of their lives. These are very small populations of patients, very specialized biological treatments. The cost is therefore commensurately higher. But most importantly, how does this affect the total medical cost of caring for a person with that condition? And in order to do this, we have to assess the role of decision analysis. And I shall explain what this is in later slides. Now, a lot has been said about evidence-based medicine. And I'm going to be talking uh, in some aspects of this. This is the so-called pyramid of evidence-based medicine. It is one version of this pyramid, which one finds in the literature. It's the version generated by the Cochrane collaboration. Uh, of which I shall make some comments, and um, as is, I guess, uh, natural, the Cochrane collaboration puts their own systematic reviews as being the highest level of evidence. And then all the other levels come after them, other systematic reviews and meta-analyses, and evidence guidelines, uh, randomized clinical drugs, controlled studies, and so on and so forth. There's a concept which has been developed in the past 30 years or so. There's a lot of merit to it. It's very important that in medicine we have absolute criteria for determining evidence. There is, however, in my opinion, a certain level of dogma inoculated in this concept. It has become a field in its own right, and it has resulted in some unfortunate and, in my mind, difficult to justify decision-making. Why is this important for new patients? Health technology assessments, including the assessment of evidence, are extremely important in informing decision-making. 
For example, authorities thinking of putting in place screening programs, such as testing for Alpha 1. Healthcare payers deciding, as I've said, for which technologies to pay for, whether they are devices, procedures, or drugs. Healthcare organizations deciding whether to exclude or implement new technologies. I think these are things to which you immediately resonate. And of course, such as the people I represent, healthcare companies who produce new products at least need to demonstrate a level of benefit for the product to justify the cost. So we both have the issue of benefit through clinical trials and the justification of the cost through cost-effectiveness analysis. Now, one of the things which is, I guess, underpinning healthcare delivery, especially in socialized systems, such as those present in Europe, is the concept of the public health and so-called societal perspectives. And of course, we all agree, because besides being patients, we are also taxpayers, that there is a great need for society to benefit overall from the consumption of healthcare resources. There is no controversy here. But the problem that I see in relation to statements made such as this, that the primary objective is to maximize the aggregate improvement and that the underlying premises of cost-effectiveness analysis basically means that society wishes to maximize the aggregate health benefit convert. The problem I see in these otherwise wise and innocuous statements is that they tend to overshadow the needs of small patient populations. There is no controversy in saying society has to benefit, but we are also part of society. And one of the problems which has become now very important in the way in which health technology assessment is carried out is that since the aggregate benefit is geared towards the overall public health, there is a tendency to exclude the important interests of patients at the end of this decision-making process. I will show how this is in some examples, but first of all, let's start with the good news. Some authorities on this continent, and it is intriguing because in my opinion, Sweden, which was mentioned yesterday in ways which perhaps we would like to see improved, but some authorities, some health technology assessment authorities, this is the Swedish authority here, have declared very good value principles in relation to allocation of healthcare resources, and they are shown on this slide, the human value principle underlying the respect for equality of all human beings, the need for a solidarity principle, which says that people with more severe diseases are prioritized, and of course the cost-effectiveness principle, which we'll be talking about, but observe that the Swedes talk about reasonableness from a medical, humanitarian, and social economic perspective, and I will come back to Sweden towards the end of my talk. Now let's talk a bit now about our uh, requirements in the area of rare diseases. These are not um, general principles, these are basically my principles and those of my association as we have explored this field. First of all, like uh, FDR, like uh, President Roosevelt many, many years ago, we do not think there is anything to fear but fear itself in relation to health technology assessment. We think that if all the evidence is used, and I shall describe how, if dogma is rejected, and if patients are involved, health technology assessments are actually good news. So this is the first message I seek to deliver. Do not be afraid of these processes. But I'm going to have to now discuss a bit the question of cost effectiveness. And as I said, I will have to describe some technical details, and my reason for this is very simple. It is because these involve patients, and I seek to involve and collaborate with patients in your community to try and improve the situation for alpha-1 antitrypsin. So we're going to talk about cost-effectiveness analysis, and in cost-effectiveness analysis, outcomes are expressed as so-called quality-adjusted life years. I'm going to be talking about the quality. Some of you have maybe experienced this terminology. So when, when I talk about quality, it's very simple. The definition of the quality is a year in perfect health. If you have a year in perfect health, 
you have one quality adjusted life year. So importantly, when we talk about the quality, the quality, we are involving quality of life, not just longevity, not just life expectancy, but also quality. It's not just a case of how long you live, but also whether you're living a full, happy, healthy, productive life. And it is estimated from the benefit of a treatment and the time during which the benefit occurs. And of course, once diagnosed with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and put on a treatment for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, that is treatment for life, because this is a chronic disorder, until we have something like this was described yesterday, the promise of gene therapy. And therefore, we can then estimate the cost of equality. I want to state at the outset that this is what health technology assessment authorities do. They calculate the cost of equality. And they make a decision on whether the treatment should be subsidized, reimbursed, on the basis of the cost of the quality. So this is important. And as I said, this includes health-related quality of life, and this is defined as all aspects of health that are directly experienced, including physical, social, mental, and general perception, whether you feel healthy. And this is something which is measured. And I will show how. You patients are crucial in health technology assessment involving quality of life. Quality of life underpins the calculation of the quality and obtaining the cost of the quality, I say again and again and again, is what health technology assessment is about. And to do this, we need patient input. And one of the biggest problems we've had in chronic disorders in relation to the prioritization of the treatments is that patients have not always been involved in calculating how much a treatment improves their quality of life. So this is something we seek to improve. Now I'm going to describe to you very simply how this is done because it's actually not too difficult to understand conceptually, although it's a sophisticated field in its own right. And I think it's important that you understand how we estimate quality of life. We do this very simply through questionnaires. We give patients the opportunity to answer questions about their quality of life in relation to a treatment through a questionnaire. And on the basis of that questionnaire, we then get through a scale an idea of how the benefit is occurring. So on this scale, which we get from the questionnaire, we get a scale from zero, which basically means you've got zero quality of life because you're dead. Of course, we don't ask questions of dead people. And one is a state of perfect health. And generally when people are questioned, they come out somewhere in this range of the scale. I'm going to show you how this is done to an example. Let's say that we've got, as I said, it is calculated by benefit multiplied by the time in which it is in place. That's the quality just right here. So I come up to somebody, let's say, just for the sake of argument in your community and ask, on a scale of 1, which is the highest, to 0, which is the lowest, how do you rate your health? Person with alpha 1. And let's say that the person thinks about it, this is putting it quite simply, and says, I rate my health about 0.5, 50% of what it should be. Fine. And let's assume that on the basis of what we know through the knowledge of the disease, the person will live for another 40 years. Then to calculate how many qualities this person is involved in, it's very simple. 0.5 times the 40 years. So this person has 20 points to look forward. Not too difficult. You can do it without a calculator. Especially if you're not as old as me. However, let's say that the person is now starting to be given some kind of treatment, maybe augmentation, maybe another alpha-1 type related treatment. And after some time on this treatment, we do the assessment again, and we ask the person, so how are you feeling now? And the guy says, or the lady says, well, actually, now I'm feeling better, so I assess myself at 0.7. That's fine. And we know that through this treatment, the life expectancy is also going to increase. So we're going to go from 40 years to 50 years. So now we've got calculated the quality again. And now it's 0.7 times 50, and we've got 35 qualities. So what's happened? Before the treatment, the person had 20 qualities. After the treatment, the person had 35. As a result of the treatment, the person now has 15 more qualities. 
This is what your taxpayer dollars or euros are being used for in health technology assessment authorities. This is what they're doing all the time. They're calculating how many qualities are available as a result of a treatment. They're then calculating how much the treatment costs. They're saying, okay, so a quality for alpha 1 is X thousands of users. And then they make a decision. Well, as I said, why is it important? <coughs> Because estimating the number of qualities is always what is done. Now, in the United States, I just briefly mentioned this, in comparative effectiveness research, all we do is we compare the number of qualities. So in the previous example, we compare 20 to 35, and if that is 35 relative to 20, we will say that the treatment is favored. Let's look at a simple example in order to show how authorities compare treatments. Let's say we've got a comparison of two treatments. And the beautiful thing about the quality is that it is universally applicable. So you can use it to compare any kind of healthcare intervention. It's not just for alpha 1 or rare diseases. So we're going to compare here two types of healthcare intervention. A new wheelchair for elderly people to special postnatal care for premature babies. So this is going to increase the quality of life by 0.1. These are just random examples. We're going to get 10 years benefit because these are elderly people and they only benefit for another 10 years. Therefore, this gives us one quality. Special postnatal care is given to these infants. They are prematurely born. They have uh, problems. But this is going to increase their quality of life by 0.8. They're going to benefit for at least 35 years. This is going to give us 28 qualities. Which do we choose? This is what we call in the English vernacular an old brainer. <laughs> Why is it important in cost effectiveness analysis? Because in cost effectiveness analysis, we do not just compare the qualities, we compare the cost per quality. So if I go back to the wheelchair and the special postnatal care, this time again we have the increase in quality of life, we have the benefit time, and we have the cost. Now we're, in, we're putting in dollars. So let's say that this costs for 4,000 per, per life year, and we just do the simple arithmetic, and the cost per quality of giving these elderly people their wheelchair is actually $40,000 per quality adjusted life year, per quality. That's the cost. Let's look at the babies. If we give the babies their treatment, the cost is a quarter of a million dollars. So it is much higher than the cost of the wheelchair. But, if we calculate the cost per quality, because we are getting many, many more qualities, it's actually much cheaper in terms of quality adjusted life we have. So, which gets chosen? In my opinion, this is another no-brainer. And the important thing is that this is used to rank and prioritize interventions. So, over here, very quickly, I've got you some costs per quality, for various medical interventions. So the use of, let's say, um, uh, you know, stimulating factors in elderly people with the leukemia has a cost per quality of over a quarter of a million dollars. Quite expensive. EPO in dialysis for renal failure, it gives us a cost per quality of 140,000 and so on. Believe it or not, Viagra is actually very cheap in cost per quality because you only cost about $5,000 per quality adjusted life year. Why do you think this is? There's many, many people going to be get wanting Viagra, and they're going to be taking it for a long time. But the important thing about this list is very simple, ladies and gentlemen, because around here, you can see these numbers here, between 50 and 100,000 US dollars per quality is what we call the threshold. Most authorities, including those in this country and in many of the countries of Europe, the United Kingdom and so on, will consider reimbursing a treatment if the cost per quality does not exceed this range. If it's below this range, it's generally not a problem. If it's above this range, it starts to be a problem. It starts to require more work and advocacy. I have gone into this in some detail because you need to understand that the decisions which shape your treatments and your lives are hanging on these numbers. Be aware of this. 
Now you might say, well, so does this mean that everybody's going to get Viagra? No, because there are other considerations and it's important to recognize that there are also political considerations. Although objectively speaking, treatments like this are actually cost effective, they're not always given public subsidy because there are other considerations including politics and perception. And of course, let me make one very crucial point. Just because a treatment is cost effective doesn't mean that it's cheap. If the cost per quality is only $5,000, but 50 million men want it, that's going to be very expensive. And there's some other decision making is coming to place. So I think that I've given you a, a, a brief introduction to cost effectiveness analysis and the use of the quality in order to give you an appreciation of why this is important to me. Now, all these concepts have been developed in relation to conventional healthcare funding and very little thinking was put in in relation to rare chronic diseases. Diseases which are rare and are needed the treatments over a whole of life have been given very little consideration. And it's important to understand that this has disadvantaged greatly rare chronic diseases in terms of being considered for reimbursement for two reasons. Again, some technical details. When benefits are looked at over a long period, the method to calculate the quality results in what's called discounting. What do I mean? It's a little bit like putting your money in the bank and rather than having it increase over the years, it decreases. The technique requires that a benefit, if it is going to be over the whole of life, is actually discounted so it becomes smaller. So, if you are alpha 1 and augmentation and you're over the whole of life, the benefit calculated by the authorities decreases over time. There are reasons for this which I will not go into. But obviously you can appreciate that for a chronic disease, this is lethal. It means that the benefit shrinks in the eyes of the people who are making this decision whether to give you the benefit. So this is very important to recognize. The other one is that the utility, the benefit estimates for people with chronic disorders tend to underestimate the seriousness of conditions. I think you can appreciate this. We know through sociological research that people who have a chronic disease and have had it for a number of years tend to become used to it to a certain extent. And they subjectively underestimate the possible benefits of a treatment. We call this the rocking the boat phenomenon. They don't want to rock the boat. We can see this very often, as I shall show you in hemophilia. When we talk to people and we say, do you want to go to prophylaxis rather than episodic treatment? When they are used to episodic treatment for many years, they hesitate. Even though prophylaxis protects them from bleeding, they hesitate to rock the boat. This is very easily demonstrated to the sociological literature. But look at this with hemophilia, which is an area which I have much more familiarity. These are, again, these scales, these benefit estimates, comparing prophylaxis and on demand. And this is asking some patients and some patients' parents. And you can see that the differences between prophylaxis and on demand are not very high. This is because patients who are on demand are used to it and do not wish to rock the boat. And it is important. How do we get these answers? We get them to these questionnaires, and this is just an example of a questionnaire. I am using this at the moment in a project with the primary immune disease community, immune deficiency disease community, and I just want to give it as an example of these questionnaires. Hopefully someday we will be able to do this with your community. I just want to make a point about discounting. This is a complicated graph. I just want to make one point. Look at this box. When the benefit is discounted by 3.5%, what the authorities use is 3.5%. This is very important. The English authorities, for example, use 3.5%. This means that the cost effectiveness is very low. It's less than 20%. If the benefit is only discounted by 1.5%, the cost effectiveness is over 90%. So these numbers, these work calculations, these graphs might seem difficult and boring to you, but they are what is deciding whether it's a treatment or not. And it is important to understand that these things 
are kneeling to be questioned. Now, how can things go wrong? Well, actually, I'm going to draw an example with your community to show how things have gone wrong. Now, let's go back to the topic collaboration, and I have a feeling that Dr. Chapman might mention this. Well, as you know, about two or three years ago, the topic collaboration had published the review, which is very authoritative. This is an body which has a lot of authority, and they concluded that augmentation therapy with alpha-1 antitrypsin cannot be recommended in view of the lack of evidence of clinical benefit and the cost of the treatment. Now, let me just say one thing immediately. How much the treatment costs is none of their business. Because actually the Cochrane Collaboration is not supposed to comment about costs, they are supposed to be about evidence and nothing more. So whenever you see the Cochrane Collaboration talking about cost of treatment, you should shut the journal and say rubbish. However, I think that the best way of addressing this comment... The best way I find the best words to address this comment is to actually look at the words of the Alpha One Foundation in the United States, which did a meticulous analysis, which I thought was perfect, uh, in regards to this, um, to this uh, uh, analysis from the Cochrane, and these are some of their um, uh, conclusions. And one of the important things is because yesterday Dr. Dirksen, who has contributed a lot to the Alpha One field, was mentioned that Dr. Dixon was at first a co-researcher with the Cochrane uh, husband and wife team, but then he requested his name to be removed and he claimed the collaboration was not possible because uh, he said that augmentation therapy is the only available specific treatment uh, which addresses lung disease associated with alpha 1. And to just ignore it on the basis of a few numbers to studies and ignore all other studies for reasons which uh, I will mention and which I think will be mentioned more later is unacceptable. Now here's another paper which again is problematic, and this is a totally disastrous slide, but I tried to put on this slide, but I shouldn't put on three slides. But this paper is a cost-effectiveness analysis, so it's important of augmentation therapy, and they ended up with the conclusion that compared with other conventionally used health interventions, observed the language, other health conventionally used health interventions, augmentation is relatively less cost-effective. Now how did they come to this conclusion? They used data from the NHLBI registry. They considered the impact of discounting. I go back to my previous comments. Remember what I said about discounting? Important. And the impact of quality of life. So remember what I said. Those numbers, those calculations, those kind of esoteric concepts are deciding whether the healthcare intervention is considered to be cost effective. Now why was this not so good in my view? Well, they found that the cost per quality per quality was too high. They decided this is too high. However, they only used a small part of the evidence. Remember what I said at the outset. Our principle is to use all the evidence. They used only one small part of the evidence, one patient registry. They used the 3% discount of the quality. This was immediately a dagger in the heart. To say basically that you've got a treatment over the whole of life, but every year you're cutting off 3% of the benefit, if you put your money on the bank and after 50 years go and look for it with 3% of the money lose, lost every year, you find you have no money left. It's as simple as that. And they estimated, this is very important, they estimated the quality without asking the patients. They asked the doctors. Now, of course, doctors are very important. And of course, doctors know about their patients. But don't tell me that the doctor knows how I feel more than myself. They should have asked the patients rather than being in a hurry to publish their paper. So, of course, they came up with this fantastic figure of $700,000 per quality adjusted life year for the treatment. And they said, sorry, but it's not cost effective. So, this is a meta-analysis, a combination of clinical trials, and I think Dr. Chapman will describe it, so I will not belabor the, the point that when you look at other evidence, and we insist that other evidence is used, rather than the limited number of RCTs used by Cochrane, we come up with benefits in relation to the uh, question of augmentation. And you have yesterday the extremely interesting talk about which clinical parameters to measure, and I think this will be looked at later. Now let me give you an example of how to make things right. I want to make things right for your community, but we are starting to address making things right for uh, another red disease community, which is hemophilia. We have assembled, these are the lessons, and I think they are equally applicable to your community. We have assembled a coalition of the industry, the treaters and patients. We use the latest best evidence. 
for the effectiveness of prophylaxis, that means treatment for life all the time, and we use the patient survey for the benefit, and we use modern concepts for this kind. And um, I think this is the summary, and I'll show you the paper in a second, but, but what we found is basically, when we use these concepts, that prophylaxis is actually cost effective. That what we can show is that on the basis of the criteria of the agencies we looked at, which includes the United Kingdom, United States and Sweden, we can show that prophylaxis is dominant or cost effective relative to episodic treatment. In other words, it is more cost effective to treat patients before they bleed rather than when they bleed. This is extremely important. And this is just a very complex uh, uh, description of what I've just said. We have just published this, and it's available for anybody who wants it um, in the journal Hemophilia. And I think that this is the kind of message I seek to deliver, that this is the result of assembling a powerful coalition. The industry obviously has an interest. The clinicians want to see the treatments, but they know nothing about cost-effectiveness or anything like that most of the time. They are experts in clinical medicine, and that's how we want them to be. We don't want medical researchers and physicians wasting their time on this nonsense. We don't want it, but we do want their influence on the decision-making process. So we want them part of the coalition, uh, but the most important part of the coalition is you because you determine whether the treatment is effective through affecting your quality of life and I cannot overemphasize my continuing message we need your input in quality of life. In the United States, fortunately, many of these principles are starting to come in and there is a new body called the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. I am fortunate in being one of the reviewers. I am uh, one of the review panel which reviews grants which this body, this is a United States process, the government, under the uh, legislation of President Obama, has allocated $1.2 billion to be given to research involving patient-centered outcomes. It's an excellent initiative. And this focuses on the patient's problems and takes their perspective in accommodating their preferences, allowing their participation, building on their relationship with clinicians and empowering them. This is the message we want to give to the world. Patients number one, first and foremost. We live in the age of information. We live in the age of education, the internet. The era when we say we leave everything to the doctors and to the government is over. If we don't take things into our hands, we can only blame ourselves for any bad outcomes. And so I want to come to a, a, a conclusion, I hope I don't exceed it too much my time, but I want to again praise Sweden. Again, this is their authority. They say the good effects of a medicine sometimes are so great that they easily compensate for all the costs. And then it's not difficult to make a decision, because the government, first and foremost, wants to save money. And if it's very obvious that it's going to save money, that's not difficult. But the Swedes say we do not make such high demands in order to consider if the use of a medicine is cost effective. That people get well, do not experience pain and give given more normal life for using a medicine is important enough for society to be willing to pay for it. I encourage you to remind the Swedish authorities of that. And so I want to come to a conclusion, Madam Chair, and thank you all for your attention. That health technology assessment is here to stay, it is important. The motto for this community and all patients should be nothing about us without us. We shall find ways to contribute and remember, giving the picture of pain and distress is not enough. It is a hard world, it is an economically challenged world. We need to provide arguments and not just emotional ones. Patient involvement means a two-way process. We need to be in there, and in my opinion, one of the key ways of being in there is to influence the quality of life data, which I've talked about, so that gradually, and this is my last slide, we approach the situation described in the Bible that in the future there shall be no more death, sorrow or crying, and there shall be no more pain. And I thank you very much for your attention.